place. So I'm very happy to be here today with my very close friend, Bishop Peter Eaton, who's the Episcopal Bishop in Southeastern Florida. We were invited to attend the rededication of a part of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, that part of the church which is built over the tomb of Jesus. It's called the Edicule. So yesterday was the rededication of the Edicule in the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, what's the significance of this rededication? About 200 years ago, uh, in the early 1800s, there was a terrible fire in the church and it uh, weakened uh, the whole area where the tomb is. Uh, but a new structure was built and over the last 200 years, that structure has weakened considerably. And in 1947, uh, it was surrounded by steel girders to keep it from collapsing. And it's been weakening continuously ever since. Since 1947, it's been like that. Well, you know, this is a, this is a part of the world where where things take their time. And we often hear about arguments between sure. different different groups in sure. the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Sure. The the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is shared by a number of different Christian communities. During the uh, time of Muslim rule of Jerusalem. Uh, people got so fed up with the fact that the Christians couldn't agree that they put the key to the church in the hands of a Muslim family and that same Muslim family has been unlocking and locking the church every day for centuries. So certainly uh, it's taken a long time for the three main communities, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, the Latin custody, the Franciscan custody, and the Armenian Patriarchate to come to an agreement. But they've done that and it's been a historic time for relationships between the churches. But it's taken a long time to get here. There's been a hope of re redoing the Edicule for a very, very, very long time. Well, this, of course, reminds me of the arguments that Jews have about who gets to control space right. at our holiest place, at the Western Wall, and forget fixing something. Right. You know, we can't even find separate spaces to, right. to pray. The, the, the right is to celebrate the liturgy in the tomb itself. And there are only three communities that have that right. There are other communities that have spaces in the church, but not a right to celebrate in the tomb itself, which is a special thing to be able to do. So the Copts, the Syrians, the Ethiopians all have chapels around the building in various places, but they have no rights in the, in the uh, uh, tomb itself. And then, and then other communities like the Lutherans and the Anglicans, my own community, historic churches, don't have any rights in the church at all. And yet, yesterday's event seemed to show a, a kind of coming together. Right. That's true. Where did you see that in particular? Of course, we were all there from various traditions, all of the heads of churches. It was an occasion in which we were able to celebrate what everybody thinks is a fresh impetus to a closer relationship. It's a paradox that our holiest places um, uh, can bring out of us the worst possible behavior uh, and the worst possible attitudes about our fellow believers in our own in our own respective traditions. Um, but yesterday was a great sign of hope that, that some new ventures in cooperation can happen. And your church doesn't have That's rights correct. there. Um, so what attracts you to that place? Well, asking what Anglicans feel or think about something is a bit like asking how Jews feel or think about something. Fair. This is the place where by centuries long tradition, um, Christians have believed Jesus to have been buried and from which he was raised from the dead. So for me, it is the, it is the holiest place uh, uh, in, 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 in the Christian faith for me. It's a place that I always go to when I come to Jerusalem. It's usually the first place that I go to when I come to Jerusalem. Um, and a number of my friends who go to the Wailing Wall every morning to say their prayers, it has the same pull on me. As the, as, as the Western Wall does for, for my Jewish family. How do Episcopalians, Anglicans generally feel, um, do you think, about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Um, I have a bishop friend who uh, I was with in the Holy Sepulchre uh, 
thought it was just too much religion. The crowds in three or four different communities all celebrating at the same time, so you can hear Copts singing and Armenians singing. And, like the Kotel. Uh, like the Kotel, exactly like the Kotel. I have always been moved by the fact that the church draws pilgrims from right across the Christian spectrum, but also draws Muslim pilgrims, Jewish pilgrims, people who have, have no particular religious tradition. We know because because we can see who comes, that it's, that it's a, a unifying place because holy places are often unifying. Just as, just as Christians and others come to the Kotel, just as, um, just as they go to the Tomb of David, I mean, they, they, these are unifying places at, at their best. And yet, as an Israeli and a Jew, I sometimes feel when I go to the, when I come into the Christian quarter, sometimes I feel like I'm in a foreign country. Um, which is kind of fun, sure. actually. It's always sure. great to travel, sure. and I don't have to go, go far, far. That's right. to travel. Um, I see people from all over the world sure. speaking every sure. language sure. in the church, so that's that's quite wonderful. Do you have a sense of the relationship between um, what goes on in the church and Israel? The the church is run by these these different communities, right? And it's guarded by Israeli soldiers. soldiers. Yes, of course. There is something of fundamental importance to the unique character of the Holy Land, that there, that there, that there are three flourishing religious traditions here. And without three flourishing religious traditions, the Holy Land is no longer holy in its unique sense. It can't just be a Jewish place, it can't just be a Christian place, and it can't just be a Muslim place. History says that that is not a reality. Throughout history, each of these groups have tried to make, make it their it own. own. And they failed. It's important for Israel, for Judaism, and for Islam that, that the historic presence of Christianity, which is bound up with both traditions, is strong and well here because it's an affirmation of, of Judaism as well as of Islam, just as Islam's presence here is an affirmation of the other two traditions, just as Judaism, which some will say is the mother of both of those two traditions, is so important. It's not right to say that, you know, we're all the same really and our differences don't matter. Our differences are crucial, but our differences don't need to bring us into conflict. We, we come from the same place, the same soil. We're all made of this land, really. Now, this is a common home.